Uh, we are recording this because we're super excited to be able to use this, not only for those of you that are able to attend today, and, and I know Dr. Milton has plans to engage everybody, but also for how we'll be able to, to use this as a resource for professional learning, both broadly across the state, as well as locally within your regions, your districts, or your schools moving forward. So with that said, my name is Jason Klein. I am one of the members of the NIU Illinois CTE project team that's working alongside the Illinois State Board of Education's CTE and innovation team uh, to support professional learning, curriculum development, and, and the development of instructional materials for CTE, as well as one of the things we'll be moving into this year is teacher recruitment and retention to ensure that we have high quality and diverse CTE teachers across the state. With that said, we are today kicking off. We Some of you were here a couple of days ago when we we tried kicking off our summer speaker series. Um, and the theme for this summer speaker series is CTE for all students and for each student. And so we're looking specifically at uh, laying some foundation, if you will. Uh, and certainly there are many, many people across the state. And we'll get into that in the second half of the speaker series when we engage with our educator panels. But um, at really looking at what Perkins terms special populations, as well as the, the concept of non-traditional careers and helping support students in those non-traditional careers. And, um, and so that's what, we're, what our, our focus is of our summer speaker series. Um, I know that we have uh, Heather on, in, in the room from the, uh, from the ISBE's CTE and innovation team, and I won't put Heather on the spot, but I do want to welcome everybody on behalf of Marcy Johnson and Heather and the rest of the ISBE CTE and innovation team. This is core, I can tell you, to the behind the scenes conversations that they are always having. It is, it is quite impressive to me um, coming to this from, from the work that, that you do, that I've done in school districts um, to see the kinds of questions that are being asked within that team to, to say, how can we support educators better in, in doing this work with more students more effectively and, and digging into really supporting each student. So with that said, we are super lucky today to kick off with, uh, Dr. Milton is here with us from Michigan. Dr. Milton works in the Michigan Department of Education. She has a wide body of experience that she is going to be sharing with us as we look at um, the elimination of, of barriers for students with CTE uh, coursework and access to those courses. And so at this point, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Milton. Thank you, Dr. Klein. I am happy to be here today with um, everyone. Um, just a little bit about myself. You know, as Dr. Klein said, I have been with um, Michigan Department of Education 10 years now, and I work with the post-secondary, my post-secondary CTE partner to actually write the legislation, Perkins legislation, uh, for special populations. Um, I support administrators, educators, and students in answering questions and providing guidance to our special population students. In addition, I'm also a data coordinator and analyst, so I analyze data um, to see how student outcomes can be improved for our special population students in Michigan. So with that, I'm going to um, share my screen here, my presentation. And can you all see that? Yes, good. I see heads nodding, so good. So I am going to um, talk about, as Dr. Klein said, the elimination of barriers for individual CTE students. So here are some objectives uh, for my presentation. I'll talk about um, which special populations student categories are under Perkins 5 legislation the barriers that exist for students who are in each special populations category, the strategies and tools to eliminate those barriers, um, how to analyze data to address and eliminate barriers, other resources that I'll share with you, and then I'll take your questions and answers. And if you have a question on your, throughout my presentation, feel free to stop me and ask the question, or you can put your questions in the chat. 
So what are the different special populations categories? Do you know? And I think we have a poll. So let's look at the poll and see what you know about um, students in special populations. Here is your poll. Is it is a category students who are homeless, students who are migrants, students who are in the juvenile justice system, uh, system or students with a parent in the armed forces? Or is it A, B, D above, A, B, and D above? Okay, so it looks like we have everyone and you all did a good job. 11 out of 12 said um, A, B, and D, and that's correct. So students, just a, um, a note about this, students who are in the ju juvenile justice system are not part of Perkins five special populations categories. Um, some states have um, separate funds available through Perkins legislation to support students in juvenile justice facilities. So A, B, and D, all those students are in special populations categories. Okay. okay. All right, get back to my slide. So, these are the special populations categories. We have students who are in foster care or who have aged out of the foster care system, students who are homeless, students with a parent who is a member of the armed forces or is on active duty, migrant students, English language learners, students who are from economically disadvantaged families, students who are out of workforce, students preparing for non-traditional Bills, single parents, and students with disabilities. And you will notice a red asterisk by some categories. And these categories were added during Perkins 5 legislation. You will also notice migrants on the list. Um, this migrant category aligns with the Every Student Succeed Act. So this, since ESSA aligns with Perkins legislation, I also included, you know, migrant category here. So I will talk about first um, the barriers that affect students in each special populations category, and then talk about um, some solutions to these barriers. Okay, hold on one second. The poll came up again. It's, it's, it's um, freezing my screen up here. It, it should be gone now. Okay, let me stop sharing and share again. Do you still see it? You can click the X in the upper right corner to eliminate the poll from your screen. Okay. Hopefully our participants should not be seeing it now either. Okay. Yeah, that looks good from here. Okay, there we go. Okay. So the first category I am going to talk about is students with disabilities. So some questions to ask, um, some barriers, is do these students have equitable access to CTE programs? Are students given fair access to enter and complete CTE programs? What are the local programs, recruitment policies, and procedures for recruitment of these students? And when students do finally you know, enroll in the CTE program, can they complete the necessary technical requirements of the CTE program? Do CTE teachers you know, have the support and the training they need to teach students with disabilities? The, our CTE teachers, they have the technical expertise, um, but they may need assistance with, assistance with presenting the curriculum to students with disabilities. And last, do students have other resources and the supports they need to complete a CTE program? So these are all potential barriers and questions that we can ask about students with disabilities. So what are some strategies and solutions that we can help uh, for students with disabilities? First of all, for student recruitment, 
we can partner with uh, special education and the rehabilitation services staff to recruit students into CTE. In particular, in Michigan, I work with uh, my Department of Special Education. Uh, I work with the Michigan Rehabilitation Services, our Bureau of Service Services for Blind People to help recruit students into CTE. And I share information um, at the state level about how CTE can benefit students with disabilities and this information is also shared with our local programs. Um, and they are encouraged to partner with their local special education and rehabilitation staff. So if more you know, state and local agencies have access to CTE information, that's good. That's good for students. We can share this information with others so, others so we can get CTE students into CTE programs. One other um, organization that I work with is that called the Michigan Interagency Transition Team. And this organization is focused on a, trend, a statewide transition plan to support students with disabilities. So this involves uh, CTE, disability rights organizations, community mental, mental health, and many organizations throughout the state that support students with disabilities. So what I do is I, is, my role is I come in and I discuss CTE and how CTE can benefit students and how they can transition from high school to a career or to post-secondary education. And I explain the benefits of CTE, such as work-based learning and earning a credential um, that they may be able to use for employment, okay? Also, um, one other strategy to improve students' performance in CTE is to have the CTE staff participate in the students' IEP meetings. It's important for us to collaborate with special education teachers and support staff so we all understand the accommodations or modifications that students need in a CTE program. So I was a special education teacher for 10 years uh, before working for the Michigan Department of Education. And I went into the CTE classroom and supported students and I worked with the um, CTE teachers. And the students would also come to me when I was in the resource room and I would um, help them with their CTE assignments. I would um, make accommodations for them and modifications. And so we worked together in partnership to support the students. Okay. What are other states doing um, for students with disabilities? Let me see if I skip the slide here. So we talked about the teacher's training that students may need for accommodations and modifications, but students also may need resources and other supports to support them, such as technology devices. Um, so examples would be like if a student has a physical barrier in a CTE classroom, uh, they may need a, a certain desk to fit a, fit a wheelchair under, or a student who is visually impaired may need a screen reader. I had many students who had um, learning disabilities, so they may need extra time to complete a project. So work with the special education staff to determine um, the unique needs of each student to support those students in being successful in CTE. Now, I did some research and I went out to see uh, what other states are doing to support students with disabilities. So in North Dakota, they developed a grant program called Enhancing CTE Educational Opportunities for Students in Special Education. So this program awards up to $2,500 to local program, to local Perkins 5 recipients to increase enrollment, and performance of learners in special populations. So North Dakota makes connections with the State Department of Education Special Education Committees and state teacher organizations to support students with disabilities. Also, the state of Arkansas um, developed a model for supporting learners with disabilities through a partnership between um, the Arkansas Department of Education the Special Education Unit, Transition Services, and the Division of Rehabilitation Services. So these are some other examples in other states of how uh, students are being supported in CTE. 
So the homeless and foster care students, these students experience you know, similar barriers. So I kind of put them together to talk about what barriers they experience. So they experience, you know, uh, barriers with just meeting their basic needs. Um, they may not be stable in their living situation. They may not have access to adequate food, clothing, or shelter. So we know that according to, you know, Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, until a student's basic needs are met, um, they may not, they may have difficulty, you know, achieving academically. So when I, when I was in the classroom, I would actually bring in, you know, snacks for kids to eat so they would be able to focus on the academic content. These students, you know, they also may have high rates of mobility. They're constantly moving around because they don't have a stable place to live. They lack shelter. Um, they may change schools constantly. Um, they may experience social emotional issues. Uh, they may lack the tools necessary to perform academic tasks, and they have lower rates of high school completion and employment. So what are some barriers or some solutions to address these barriers? So at the state level, I collaborate with uh, McKinney Vento, homeless and the foster care liaison through the state of Michigan. And I encourage my local programs, local CTE programs to do the same, develop partnership, partnerships with these liaisons and they can help children. Um, as far as emotional supports, um, social emotional learning has the following benefits. It improves academic performance. It fosters positive attitudes and behaviors. It decreases negative behaviors. It improves the emotional health of students. And it has a lasting impact on students. It offers a high return on investment. One organization that we use here in Michigan and CTE is called CASEL, C-A-S-E-L, um, for social emotional supports for students. CASEL stands for Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. It is a nonprofit organization that partners with education institutions to share research, webinars, and other strategies to improve the social and emotional learning of students. So addressing the social and emotional aspects of students will enable students to improve in many areas of their lives and decrease barriers in the CTE program. So another um, solutions or other solutions are um, to develop a transition plan for students so that they have a clear path from high school to post-secondary education or out into career so they have a guide of where they're, they're going to go. So both students who are in foster care and homeless, um, they need physical health, they need psychological, emotional well-being, life skills, ethical behavior, they need healthy family and social relationship, relationships, educational attainment, and they need constructive educational and occupational engagement and civic engagement. And we can all give these, uh, these items to these students if we partner um, with our foster care liaisons as well as our McKinney-Vento liaisons. So the next category is um, English learners. And I have a lot of information on English learners. Of course, um, English learners, um, they may have difficulty speaking, reading and writing and understanding the English language. And the curricula that English learners are exposed to in both general education and CTE courses are not often personalized or relevant to their interests and learning levels. So what are some strategies and solutions for English learners? So actually, when I went out to do research, um, CTE is a very good uh, place for English learners to be because according to um, the Institute of Education Sciences, 
Um, CTE programs provide skill-based, career-relevant language instruction in authentic hands-on settings. And it's, this is a valuable strategy for English learners. Also, CTE programs offer connections for students and to extend their network because many of these students are immigrants. They're coming from immigrant families. So this helps them, CTE helps them build social capital within the education arena, as well as the workforce. What are some other strategies and solutions for English learners? You know, sometimes I've heard that funding is an issue to support our English learners. So a resource for this would be to work with the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act to try to get other funding for these students. And um, the state of Ohio, they partner with, or they braided funds together with the English Learner and Immigrant Students Act, which is part of Title IX of the Every Student Succeed Act. And so by them braiding funds, they were able to uh, give the students you know, culturally responsive career counseling as well as career exploration opportunities. So that's another strategy is to braid funds. I know we braid funds um, at the state of Michigan. I work with our special populations department to get other funds to support students. Okay. What are some other strategies to help English learners? So, um, we should not give a one size fits all for English learners. Some students may need help with reading. Some need help with writing. Some need help with just improving speaking skills. So find out the unique needs of the learners and adapt, adapt to, the, to the instruction to focus on those unique needs. Within the state of Michigan, we have what's called bilingual specialists. And I encourage, I work with the bilingual specialists at the state level, and I encourage our local programs to also work with those bilingual specialists to help English learners in the CTE program. Here's another strategy. There is um, technology that can be used in the classroom to support our English learners. learners. There is scannable technology. Um, there's technology on smartphones. There's word walls. There are vocabulary lists, audio directions. Um, we can use technology to facil facilitate um, language translation, visual dictionaries, and translation apps. So there are many technology tools um, that can help our English learners. Okay, so those are English learners. Our next category is students with a parent in the armed forces or on active duty. What are some barriers? So these students um, have very unique needs because they have parents who are being deployed into active duty or these parents move around frequently. So these students you know, may show signs of stress they may have an inability to function in school. They have high levels of emotional stress. So what do we need to do to help these students? They are transient. Um, they have to move when their parent moves, possibly. Um, then they may feel that they don't have a consistent routine because they are transient students. So what are some solutions that we can um, offer to families and students? We can refer these students to counselors to receive assistance with emotional distress. We can try to re retain the classroom activity and make it predictable and structured, have structured schedules. And if a family member has to deploy or they are reassigned and the student has to move, um, develop a competency checklist. A competency checklist shows the skills that the students have learned and the current CTE program. So that when they move to the next school, they can take this competency checklist to the next school and the next CTE program. So the teacher will have a list of skills that the students have mastered and they can continue learning in the CTE program. Um, also there is, um, when I did some research, 
There is an um, online tutoring program and homework help called military.tutor.com. And this will give the students some consistent routine if they have a place where they can go um, to stay current with academic work. Also, um, I know the state of Michigan has, through Veterans Administration at the state level, they have an education department. So last year, I reached out to Veterans Administration, the education department, and I had them um, give professional development to Michigan CTE staff on what is needed for these students to be successful. Um, so I don't, Illinois probably has something similar. So that's another strategy that can be used to support these students uh, who have parents in the armed forces and on active duty. Okay, the next category is students who are economically disadvantaged. What are some barriers that these students face? These students um, may lack resources to carry out academic tasks. They don't have the necessary resources. Uh, they may lack adequate transportation to and from school, and they may lack food and shelter. These students experience some of the same barriers as our, um, as our foster care and our um, homeless students. So what are some strategies and solutions for these students? So we can provide free books, materials, tools, uniforms, you know, computers, internet hotspots, and other resources to help these students be successful in CTE. And I know um, many of our local programs, CTE programs in Michigan, use Perkins funds for some of these items, such as computers, to help these students be successful in CTE programs. As far as transportation, we can provide some transportation, get transportation vouchers, you know, give them bus passes, offer them mileage reimbursement so they can get back and forth to school. Um, ensure that students have access to healthy food and nutrition by providing meals at school. Um, we can locate a local food bank distribution program in our local school communities and also on our college campuses to help these students. In the state of Michigan, uh, when students are out of school, we have a meal program set up to help students so that they can continue eating throughout the summer months to give these, food, these kids adequate access to food. Okay, the next category, um, is single parents. So single parents, um, they may feel isolated um, in school um, due to being a single parent. They feel like they stand out. Um, they have may have lack of access to childcare. And due, due to their you know, responsibilities of being a single parent, they may have difficulties with attendance, um, completing assignments, and participating in different school activities. So what can we do to help single parents? So we can have single parent support groups to help these students. Uh, we can build a community for them um, of support and social networks to help them feel, not feel so isolated. And we should not isolate you know, teen parents in separate CTE programs um, at actually access, when they have access to CTE program, that can lead to employment um, so they can sustain their family with a living wage, okay? We can also, you know, accommodate these single parents by offering courses in many different ways. We can have asynchronous online courses, synchronous, we can have face-to-face, hybrid courses, we can offer courses at different times of the day um, to accommodate the single parent's responsibilities. Okay, the next category is students preparing for non-traditional fields. What are the barriers that these students experience? So some students do not enroll in CTE programs because they don't feel like they should. They feel like, well, that's, boys do that, girls don't do that. So there are stereotypes associated with different CTE programs. So 
Um, girls, for example, um, well, they, it's been said that girls don't like math or science. So when these stereotypes exist, you know, students are less likely to enroll in CTE programs. So there's also a lack of career information about opportunities in non-traditional occupations in the pre-high school grades for students preparing for non-traditional fields. So what are some of the solutions in, uh, that we can use to help students enroll in programs non-traditional for their gender? So um, information about careers should be exposed early in the child's education. The research I did said middle school, I think it should be even earlier than middle school. It should be in elementary school. Students should be exposed to different careers, non-traditional for their gender. Okay, and that way they identify careers uh, for traditional and non-traditional career fields and CTE courses, they're able to identify it. Um, we should arrange for classroom observations in CTE classrooms. So in many local CTE programs in Michigan, they have what's called a family CTE night uh, in which students and families have the opportunity to go to CTE and visit the classrooms. And actually in each of these CTE programs, there's a student an ambassador um, that isn't in a program, non-traditional for their gender, that actually explains the program to students and families. Um, so they get to see, oh, there's a girl in this program, so it may, it may be okay. My daughter, who was in CTE, that's how she got exposed to science. And she chose the health science field um, in CTE. So we should expose students and have students visit the CTE classes early on. We can also work with business and industry to create job shadows um, and site visits with small groups for both traditional and non-traditional students. Okay. What are some other strategies and students to prepare students for non-traditional fields? We can bring in um, professionals and role models from the, from the field to speak to our students in the CTE classroom. We can demonstrate common activities. These professionals can demonstrate common activities and projects and arrange for on-site projects that relate to their career, to the career that they would like to go in. We can also work with the guidance counselor to assist uh, students to be introduced to non-traditional career fields and enrolling in CTE programs and courses. So another strategy is to work with peer groups. Uh, we can involve non-traditional students in recruiting new students, just like I said, like with career night, you can get a non-traditional a uh, student in a program that can introduce the CTE program to other students. Okay, migrants. These are students that um, have to move across the country and cannot, you know, remain in school all, all the time. So their most significant barrier is mobility because they are constantly transitioning. So infrequent moves and economic hardship um, make uh, education hard for these students and they may fall behind, you know, academically. So what can we do to help these students? So educators can create a positive environment for students who are migrant. Since students, you know, they may constantly transition, uh, they find themselves in unfamiliar new classrooms, and that makes them feel isolated and lonely. So teachers can help uh, students feel a sense of safety and trust by assigning an older student to act as mentors or buddies for these new migrant students in the classroom. Teachers can also incorporate um, the students' experiences within CTE lessons, and this will help build the students' strengths. Um, so by incorporating lessons that focus on the student the students' diverse experiences and richness, richness, richness of the students' culture and languages, this helps the students' self-images and also their sense of self-worth. Okay, the next category is students who are out of workforce. Um, this category really applies to post-secondary students in CTE. 
Um, so, but I'm going to include some barriers here that these students face. Um, they may have the stress of, you know, remaining in a CTE program and looking for employment because many times these students are just trying to care for their family. So, what are some strategies for these students? We can help these students identify transferable skills um, to connect um, instructional relevance and build an opportunity for these students to enter high demand career fields so they can support themselves and that, that offer good benefits, get careers that offer good benefits for themselves and their family. So we can identify um, employment-based training, such as a work study, subsidized employment and apprenticeships that provide wages while attending school for these students. So that was a mouthful and that was all the 10 categories of special populations. So I'm gonna stop and um, see if you have any questions for me so far. Uh, please do feel free to unmute yourself or to drop questions in the chat. Uh, Rodrigo, Bill, and I are all keeping an eye on the chat and we'll be happy to also call out your questions there. Okay, um, now I've talked a lot, so I'm going to let you all discuss what I've just talked about. So I'm going to you know, divide you up into some groups and these are the questions that you will talk about. What are some other potential barriers that you think of that may hinder students from enrolling in and completing CTE programs? How can the solutions and strategies that I've just shared assist students in being successful in CTE programs? And if you have other solutions and strategies that I haven't shared that you wanna share, you can share them. So you're gonna choose a person to record and you're going to choose a person to report out. So I think you're going to be divided up into, I don't know, four or five people per group. We'll see what time it is. So why don't we do that for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back and we'll report out what you have. So you should have a join on your screen now. So enter that group that you have on your screen. And I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. I think I'm going to bop into Heather's group. There's no one else going into room three. Will you stay out here, Rodrigo? So if Dr. Milton comes back, and then you can also help get some of these other folks. So I will be back.
Rodrigo. Can you tell me how to pron pronounce Melissa's uh, last name? Um, Melissa, let's see. Oh, yeah. oh uh, from our office? Yeah, from your office. Gotcha. I um, can tell you in a second because I don't know that I remember her last name. <laughs> R-O-B-L-E-S. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, I just started here two weeks oh, ago. Okay. No, Sorry. it's all good. Uh, uh, so, Robles. Robles. Mm -hmm. Robles. I just want to make sure I get it right when I'm at the end. Robles. Okay, thank you. No, absolutely. And then, um, did you want them to go for 10 minutes for this discussion? Yes. So, Perfect. let's see how long has it been so far. Uh, it'll be about five minutes in a minute. Okay. Yeah, 10 minutes should be good. Yep. Thank you. No problem. For your help. Okay, thanks.
Rodrigo, how much longer do they have? About a couple minutes. Uh, they have 30, 30 seconds. Okay, almost done. Okay, thank you. No problem. Can you, um, Rodrigo, can you let me know when everyone has returned? Yes, I think we have everyone's back. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, how was your group discussion? That was a quick 10 minutes. So how many groups did we have? We had a total of four groups. Four groups. So who would like to report out first? I can do that for our group. I was in a group with Bill and Julianne. Okay. Um, we talked, um, we, most of our conversation, we talked about the importance of um, counselors and of other support people. Um, like I was sharing in our region, some districts using Perkins money, others using local money have had a, have added the role of college and career counselor. So a dedicated person that doesn't have like a alphabetical part of, you know, counseling as an A through L general counselor and how that's really um, taken some of the pressure off the general counselors and provided mm -hmm. for more robust career advising. Julianne's at a post-secondary institution and she really talked about the work that they do mm -hmm. with their high school counselors um, to make sure that their high school counselors understand their mm -hmm. post-secondary CTE programs and how best to support students and advise students um, that might be interested in dual credit in those programs while mm -hmm. in high school or just interested in those programs post high school. Okay, thank you, Cassie. Those are all good strategies. I know within the state of Michigan, we have special populations counselors to focus on students in special populations to give them the support they need. So who else would like to report out? How about group two? Sorry, that was group two. So uh, maybe group one. Oh, group one, <laughs> thank you, Rodrigo. Sure. Yep. Um, I'm happy to go for us. Um, okay. thank I you, was, Barbara. Yeah. I was in a group with Brian and Brian and Amy Mm -hmm. um, and the big barriers we talked about were um, transportation is a bit of a barrier, finding people to fill the positions is a bit of a barrier. But the two biggest ones we talked about were the parents who discourage students from applying to these programs because they have some misinformation about status and whether or not it's desirable to be engaged in these programs. Um, and, and trying to overcome that is, is one of the biggest barriers to the CTE program. And then the other one we talked about is barriers, particularly with um, for students who have low grades and low test scores who are prevented from applying for them or who are given a lower priority. Um, in, yep. in terms of the admissions process. Okay, thank you for populations. Thank you. Um, so in Michigan, we have the same type of barriers where parents discourage students. That's why we encourage, you know, parents and families to go out to CTE programs and actually visit the programs because students who complete CTE, they, they can sometimes make more money than people who go to college. So we need to stop gearing, I think, students just for college. There are also other pathways that students can take to be successful in life. So thank you, Barb, for those comments. Okay, how about um, group three? Susie, can we? I'm, I'm really not certain 
what group number we were, but I'll report oh, it for our matter. group. <laughs> so anyway, um, we we talked about the support staff you had mentioned in your presentation. You know, the the designated um, personnel for areas and like a special populations coordinator of sorts, which could be yeah. of extreme value to mm -hmm. um, the organization. And so I think a barrier for some of our schools is that they just don't have those resources in place. And mm -hmm. as Cassie mentioned, you know, some of the schools are getting a college and career coordinator. I have one school in my consortium of schools mm -hmm. that has that, and it makes a huge difference. It takes the pressure off of the designated academic counselors for scheduling, mm -hmm. but yet move and just can focus on apprenticeships and getting these kids connected to careers. We did talk about in our group, we're starting to see a shift within our society, I believe, but it's slowly taking, it, it, you know, that ship takes a little mm -hmm. while to, right. to turn mm -hmm. and getting the message into our elementary schools at that elementary level. And we're really focusing on the middle school level kind of in our region. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it's the long game. You know, we're not going to see an immediate shift, but it's, it's the long game. So we talked, a second barrier that we um, talked about was our schedules within our schools don't allow for our students to um, maybe take some of the electives, have the opportunity to take early on in their high school career. So they're entering some of these career fields or um, pathways their junior year, which we wanna try, if we could really just kind of make a change within our schedules, um, mm -hmm. it would be advantageous for our students. So we, we talked mm -hmm. about scheduling being a barrier. Okay, thank you, Gail. In our last group, would you like to report out, please? Our, our group hasn't reported. And while I'm happy to defer to, okay. to Susie in particular, I do wanna make a connection between part of what we talked about and what Cassie had mentioned. And that is that Cassie had talked about the, the counselors. We just heard more about the counselors. Um, we, we talked about almost the match partner for the counselors as we ramp up work-based learning. It, it takes a, a unique role really to support mm -hmm. that work. There's a lot of logistics we, and that helps get at some of the barriers and overcoming those barriers for individual students. Um, but there's also the building of relationships, which mm -hmm. is of course very time consuming, especially initially with business and community partners. And then those relationships need to be sustained as people change roles. And then the, the third piece is um, if we really leverage those relationships, we can get at our instructional goals through those relationships too and, and help those people learn from, from the educators um, what we want to most give feedback on, for example, on the, in Illinois, we have our list of, of essential skills or cross-sector essential employability mm -hmm. competencies, um, along with the technical competencies per career pathway, and, and not only what to give feedback on, but also how to give feedback, right? A lot of those people may not be typically working with a 16 or 17-year-old, and so um, so there's a lot that can come from roles like that, and um, we'd love to see in addition to an increase in counselors and maybe some specialized counselors like has just been talked about college and career counselors or mm -hmm. counselors to support special populations. Um, also this, this other role set to support work-based learning and, and those kind of partnerships specifically. Okay, thank you. Those are all good strategies. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so I am going to share my screen again and go to the second part you know, my presentation. So the second part of my presentation, um, I'm also a, a data analyst for the state of Michigan for CTE programs. And I dig deep into the data and break it apart to see where the gaps are and to see, you know, which students are not being supported, you know, in CTE. So I'm going to see how, I'm going to talk about how data can also decrease the barriers for students in special populations and help them, them to have you know, successful outcomes. So we can do this by disaggregating our data and breaking it apart into pieces 
to see which special population student categories are not getting into certain CTE programs or not completing and so forth. One other tool that we can use is the comprehensive local needs assessment, which is required under Perkins 5 legislation. So what data elements can we look at to help our special population students? So we can look at our Perkins, you know, core performance indicators. And I looked on the Illinois website and I do see data broken out by core performance indicator. I didn't see too much about special population students, but I did see overall how data is broken out. So we can look at, you know, how students perform. Some of our indicators are math, reading, science, you know, the graduation rate. So we can look at those things by special populations category to see how students are performing. We can look at students, student enrollment. You're on a yearly basis, I look at the enrollment. Is um, uh, the, the total increasing for our special population students who are enrolling in CTE programs? We can look at the concentrators, you know, concentrate traders, we did students complete at least two courses in a CTE program. Completers, did students complete an entire CTE programs? Those are some of the questions that we can ask. Also, um, in the state of Michigan, we also break down our data by work-based learning. We can look at, look to see what type of work-based learning um, did each student participate in by special populations category. Was it just career awareness? Was it exploration? Did they have some type of career training, preparation, or did they participate in apprenticeships? Are, are our students in special populations receiving the work-based learning that they need and not just at the career awareness level? Another aspect that we can look at is um, career and technical service organizations which we are starting within the state of Michigan to look at, you know, which students are participating in CTSOs um, by special populations category. So those are some of the data elements that we can look at to see how students are performing. And another one is, like I mentioned, the comprehensive local needs assessment. So we can ask questions on the CLNA about how are students be being recruited into CTE? What barriers do students in special populations face? Are there certain career clusters that students are not being enrolled in? Are they underrepresented in certain career clusters? Or are they overrepresented in other career clusters? I know within the state of Michigan, we have many special population students enrolling in um, culinary. And I don't know why that is, but when I looked at the data, I saw that and why? Um, we need more students in Michigan enrolled in STEM, you know, CTE programs, okay? So those are, those are some of the questions that we can ask. And I had a group activity for this, but instead of, you know, putting you into other groups, another group, I'm just going to open it up to the floor and tell me how you have used data if you have. I'm a data nerd, so everybody don't, doesn't use data, but if you have used data to examine um, student performance in CTE and see how students can improve. Please share your experience with us. ISB had um, EFE directors like myself and Brian and Gail this mm -hmm. um, fall, was it fall or spring? I don't know. The, the time has bled together, participate in a workshop that Advanced CTE put on, um, and it was all focused on um, using your data uh, to, de to define gaps and then um, using their model of um, to, to kind of uh, determine why those gaps might be occurring and, and problem solve around that. And then, so they had this very, uh, you know, this dashboard tool in Excel that we were able to take the data our state gives us and plug in and, you know, different sections lit up different colors, you know, that meant different things, you know, uh, percentage point gaps and things like that. So that's um, my most recent experience. Um, and we, we saw trends um, 
around um, like racial ethnic differences um, in mm -hmm. choice of pathway. Um, I don't remember the special ed students in culinary trend. I don't like that you were sharing happens in mm -hmm. Michigan. I, I don't remember seeing that one, but um, definitely we saw certain racial ethnic groups kind of um, in high in pathways at a higher rate, and those pathways were sometimes the pathways that pay less. Um, mm -hmm. So we talked about that that day and did some other um, examples. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. That's all good information. So data is just not data; it tells a story, and people don't sometimes understand that. They'll tell a story about where the gaps are and where students they're not getting an opportunity to perform. So anyone else would like to share? Okay, let's go on then. So these are all the references I use for my presentation. Um, and I wanna point out the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, NAPE. Um, that is a very good organization. Um, I had the opportunity to serve on the executive board here uh, during the past year. Um, they specifically focus on uh, special population students and equity and CTE. Um, they have a lot of good resources on their website. They give professional development. I work with them on a yearly basis to give professional development to our CTE staff. So I encourage you to go out and to their website and look at some of the um, resources that they do offer. And these are some of the other references I use for this presentation. So what questions do you have for me? I hope this was helpful to you. None? Okay. I'll, I'll start with a question. Okay. Um, and the question I'll start with is, um, what, what advice would you give to a local district based on what you've seen work in, in Michigan with people who've been particularly successful at breaking down barriers for students in special populations or, or getting students into non-traditional career pathways mm -hmm. as a starting place to like just get the ball moving? What would be a great first step um, so that you would recommend? A great first step would be to, we have our local CTE programs that are not performing as well, partner with another program within the state who is performing well. So if that local program has high numbers of non-traditional students, um, high percentage rate of you know, completers and concentrators and CTE programs, we have that other local program partner with another program so that, that, that they can get their performance up. Uh, we know that we have to do um, regional improvement plans Perkins legislations require it. So in their regional improvement plan, they will specifically lay out how they plan to improve, you know, student performance as far as non-traditional students and other areas within career and technical education. So that's, that's what we do. Since we're a local control state too, uh, we have to put it back on the locals to, for them to help each other. We try to help as much as we can at the state level by guiding them though. Does it answer your question? Yeah, that's a that's a great answer. My follow up, yeah. and 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 I certainly would welcome answers from from the rest of the group. But is um, in Illinois, in our context in Illinois, and and this might look different in different regions. Um, and if if you don't want to answer, know that I'll be curious to come back and talk about it with people who are who are in the audience today, as well as those who who watch later on. What do we think the barriers to like those kind of partnerships across districts will be? What what can we do to build a culture in Illinois to, and maybe we have one already. I, that's one of those things where I'm not really sure. I've been in examples in school districts where we've been really great at partnering with neighboring districts or, or even non-neighboring districts. Um, and I've been in, in situations where the opposite has been true. So I'm curious about, about people's thoughts about that. And we certainly, I'd welcome answers if there are answers, either unmuting yourself or in the chat. Um, but I'm also happy to turn it back over to Dr. Milton. Okay, so I'll go on. 
So um, this is getting to the end of my presentation. I want to um, give a very special thank you um, to the Illinois State Board of Education, Career and Technical Education, uh, the Northern Illinois University Career and Technical Education Project Team, uh, Dr. Jason Klein and his staff, Rodrigo uh, Lopez, Melissa Robles, and William Rose. Thank you so much for your support um, in putting this presentation, helping me coordinate this presentation for Illinois educators. I appreciate it. Um, and with that, that is the end. There was one thing that um, Dr. Klein did put in the chat that I noticed during the uh, group breakouts about students in juvenile justice facilities. I, I also support those students at the state level in Michigan. And we have partnered, I have partnered with uh, National Institute of Work and Learning. I found them through research and they support our students in juvenile justice facilities with career readiness. So it's all tied to CTE. So that's just another resource for you if you're interested in that. With that, that is the end. This is my contact information. You are welcome anytime to call me or email me if you have questions about this content. Thank you for listening.